Hey everyone, my name is Kurt with the WX Capital team. Given everything going on in the world today, we're putting together a couple videos on vaccines and the race for a COVID vaccine specifically. What makes a vaccine more or less efficacious than the others? Are there different ways of triggering the immune system? And which company has the best chance of success? Before we answer those and other questions though, it's important to understand how vaccines actually work. So in general, a vaccine is basically injecting your body with a foreign agent. This causes your immune system, in particular your T cells, to not only fight against it and get rid of that foreign agent, but also to be on guard for if that foreign agent ever comes back. This long-term protection is what is called the adaptive immune system. Basically, the adaptive immune system lets your body have a more robust and more comprehensive response to any invaders it has already fought against. But what parts of a virus does your body need to be exposed to and how much does your body need to be exposed to in order to confer this long-standing protection? That's where the different types of vaccines differ a little bit, and we're going to dive into those questions now. But let's start back in the late 1700s when vaccinology reached the West. Edward Jenner, a British scientist, was studying smallpox, which used to kill hundreds of thousands of people every year. Jenner noticed that milkmaids who had been exposed to cowpox, a related virus, were immune to smallpox when the epidemics would reach their villages. So he decided to take some material from a cowpox sore and inject it into his test subject. After injecting, he exposed his subject to smallpox multiple times, which today would be considered a pretty unethical trial design. And as expected, this subject never actually developed smallpox because their body had learned from its exposure to the gentler but related cowpox virus how to fight off the deadly smallpox virus. This early history of the vaccines falls into the category of live attenuated vaccines. Basically, a weakened form of the actual virus itself is used as a vaccine. There are still live attenuated vaccines in use today, including the vaccine for chickenpox, as well as the MMR combined vaccine. However, some of the limitations of this type of vaccine include that they are difficult to store, and people with weakened immune systems generally are not able to, be, to receive these types of vaccines. Let's fast forward now to the 1950s with the devastating polio virus that caused a national health crisis in the U.S., including crippling FDR as a child. So in 1953, scientists led by Dr. Salk developed a strategy to inactivate the polio virus so that it could no longer infect anyone but would still be recognized by the immune system and cause immunity to develop to the different pieces of the virus. So this was a huge technological breakthrough and actually this method of vaccination has not gone completely obsolete as we'll see when we look at the current virus development. So for example, there are certain key players in the COVID vaccine space who are taking this inactivated vaccine approach. Sinovac, a Chinese company and a major contender to have the first vaccine available, is using this approach. So we've really now developed uh, more effective ways to inactivate the virus and, and optimize the immunogenicity, but this still borrows heavily from the vaccine approach developed by Dr. Salk in 1953. So the next evolution of vaccine technology is to use only specific parts of the virus instead of using, let's say, the whole weakened form of a virus or the whole inactivated form of the virus. For example, we have vaccines that target only a specific protein that is found on the surface of the virus. There are actually a lot of vaccines you, you yourself are probably familiar with that fall under this category. For example, the HPV vaccines are recombinant vaccines that target the capsid, capsid protein. So one limitation is that ongoing protection against disease typically requires booster shots. Uh, in order to keep your immune system prime. So for example, with the HPV vaccine in general, you're receiving multiple doses, depending on when you start the course, um, in order to achieve that long-term immunity. How, uh, some of the advantages though, are that, you know, because you're only using a piece of the virus, even people with uh, weak immune systems can generally get these types of vaccines with, f with few issues anticipated. So those are all very well-established, historically validated, uh, forms of vaccines, but we've actually also seen some really cool new technologies hitting hitting the clinic in the last few years as well. One of these is to use a viral vector vaccine. So, for example, the AstraZeneca um, COVID vaccine is actually a recombinant viral vector approach. So th the way these vaccines work is to actually inject a live virus into the patient. But don't worry, this isn't the COVID virus. Uh, the, what they're using is called an adenovirus, which are also used in gene therapies. Thankfully, this virus can't replicate itself in humans as they put it in a weakened but still alive state. Uh, and using this virus, scientists are able to insert genes to produce pieces of the COVID virus that will then trigger an immune response. So this way, when the actual COVID virus tries to infect the body, the immune system already recognizes parts of it, leading to COVID being stopped in its tracks. The mRNA-based technique has been in development for other infectious diseases such as Zika and Ebola and represents what most would consider the most cutting edge technological approach here. It definitely has some pretty key advantages in that it cuts down the manufacturing burden that comes with something like viral inactivation and also doesn't need to be incorporated into the genome of the cell to invoke the immune response. 
Instead, the cell just needs to be able to read this mRNA, which contains instructions to build proteins uh, for bits of the virus that will basically then cause an immune reaction. Um, mRNA transcripts are also pretty transient, so the expectation is that they would disappear from circulation fairly quickly. So Moderna is definitely considered the leader here uh, with their mRNA-1273 candidate, um, although there are a number of other companies working on this type of vaccine, including some big names like Pfizer as well as CureVac. So it's actually a pretty logical progression, right? Like we go from using the entire weakened form of the virus to using a killed form of the virus to using only just a piece of the virus to using now the just the instructions for making that piece of the virus in order to still get that immune response, right? So Along that spectrum, in theory, the vaccines are getting more and more safe, uh, more and more br uh, fit for broad population use, um, but also still you know, requiring then booster shots in order to have that really strong, long-lasting immunity. There's actually a great video on Moderna's website about their COVID vaccine that explains the mechanism of action here. Uh, pretty straightforward and uh, good detail that's worth checking out. Well, we hope you learned a little bit about how vaccines work and how vaccine techniques have evolved throughout history. If you have any questions or thoughts, please share them in the comments below. You might be also be wondering now, so which method will be best to combat the global COVID pandemic? Stay tuned for our next video in which we share our thinking on what companies we think could be the ones to crack the COVID case wide open. Thank you very much. If you guys liked our video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Also check out our website at www.wx.capital. We have a great subscription service that allows you to get real-time trades as well as market commentary so you know exactly what's going on with stocks and you know exactly what we're trading and what the next hot stock pick is. See you guys around.